Good evening. It's time for Online Sunday School with Elgin First Assembly of God in Elgin, Oklahoma. I am Karen Clymer, and we are so happy to have you with us tonight. And we, I want to say before I forget it, that we always do go ahead and upload these to YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter, now called X. And we'll get that done hopefully before I go to bed tonight. So we welcome you. We start Sunday School at our church on, in the morning. We'll be 945. We have classes for all ages. 9.45 and then 10.45 is our worship service. Our pastor always has a good message for us. There will be no service Sunday night. All right, so we know we're getting ready this tomorrow. Uh, with this, our lesson, this is for December 31st, and we're just a little bit ahead, having it on, late on Saturday night. But we look forward to having, uh, having you listening tonight. Any comments that you want to make, we'd love to have them. I'd also like to remember a, a person that one of our friends here on Facebook has told us about a very close friend of hers who helped lead her to the Lord. Her name is Kathy, and she has been uh, diagnosed with a disease that, as far as I know, know, there may not be a cure. But let's believe the Lord with her. Her name is Kathy. Let's pray for Kathy. The Lord will especially touch her and minister to her and to my friend that is uh, really having a difficult time with this, somebody you're very close to and you don't want to see something like this. But thank the Lord that Kathy ministered to our friend that uh, you see here on Facebook. Sometimes we'll, we'll comment. We're so glad that Kelly made us aware of this so that we could pray. All right, the Christ Sent Life is the name of our, our lesson. And our central truth is being sent by Christ is a high privilege and serious responsibility. What a true statement. What a privilege. Being sent by Christ is a high privilege and serious responsibility. Our key verse is from Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. We'll read that from the King James Version and then the New Living Translation. Behold, or take notice, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. From the New Living Translation, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. How many times have, do you think of that scripture in, in the light of some of the things that we see happening today and how the decisions and things that we make and how our responses and our our attitude you know we have to really pray and the Lord will help us not to uh, lash out in anger but to be faithful and true and have be full of the, the sweetness of the Lord it's not to say that we're pushovers and that we're, we're floor mats to be walked on learning objectives or we will embrace our responsibility to represent Jesus on earth we will evaluate our level of commitment to Jesus, and we will boldly share the gospel with lost people. And one of the best ways we can do that is by being an example of a believer in our words and in our deeds. But sometimes it takes that we have to do take a stand and not just hide. And I'm more, uh, so many times I have heard so many people say, "Well, I just don't think that that the Lord expects me to do this." That they doesn't expect them to have any issues of any kind. They should just get along and not have. Uh, any issues no there's times that we do have to take a bold stand not a, a bullish and mean stand but not by, not that at all but we actually are christ ambassadors okay and uh, in our lesson here it, it uh, starts out uh, mentioning that jesus called 12 men to be his disciples his closest followers they came to be called apostles which means sent ones or delegates and you know this is the thing that the lord has sent us out we are the sent ones we are his delegates that we go out we stand for him we speak for him oh it's such a, a privilege but I'll tell you it's something to think about we want to make sure that we say the right things do the right things and that if we miss it and we realize we did that we just make our wrongs right that's the thing for us to do as children of God and you know you think about I think about people that influence think of the influence that Jesus had on their lives and then those apostles in turn the, in, the influence they had on people's lives and even today because the things that we read that of these some of these disciples did and uh, just it's amazing and you think that some of them like Matthew and Mark and Luke wrote uh, some they have some books you know with their name and we read how the Lord used them but they learned from him they were learners and may we always be that learners that it's always something that we want something new from the Lord fresh from him go to his word though it's been there for years and years yet the Lord can give us a truth that is fresh and new to us and it, that's what I like about God's Word. It is alive. It is alive. His Word is alive. It's not dead. All right. You, our writer asked about what person has had the greatest influence on your life it's, and mentioned something about that. And I, I thought 
uh, there's many people, but the first one I really thought of, and I've told my friend Francine many times that, uh, and her sister Chris, how that their, her, their parents had a great influence on my life. They were evangelists, and they, sometimes people, I believe that when they come into your life as a teenager, in, in, in your teenage years, that's formative years, and I remember the, the deep impact that they had, their ministry had, and not that pastors hadn't and things like that I'm, and relatives and all but there was something about those people that the Lord used them to especially touch my life and help shape my life and I remember one thing in particular that uh, Sister McAdams said Sister Ellen McAdams said was that people can ruin your reputation but they can't touch your character because that's who you really are and that just really stayed with me through through the years and I have appreciated that but many things that they had said. And so I appreciate that. And today, and I talk about it, I mean, Kelly, it's so good to have you on tonight. And uh, just so you know, we requested prayer for, for your friend, uh, Kathy. We're, we'll have others that will be joining, and this will be heard. We don't know how many others will be listening in time to pass, because we will have this out on YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter, now called X. So we want people to pray and believe for Kathy's healing. All right, so in our lesson, we're going to talk about today what Jesus did, how that he had a plan, a missions plan that he handed down to his disciples, and they were to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That was the message that they were to go, and that, and that is our message when we read, it is to go, go into all the world. Now you say, well, I can't does he expect all of us to get up and go to a foreign field. No, right where we are, but there are people he does call to the foreign mission field, and they aren't happy until they do that and obey the Lord, and that's what he wants for them in their obedience to go. And I know people that are called to a, a field off in, a, in another place, like into a, a, one, a missionary I knew recently that was preparing to go back to a foreign land, to Taiwan. She was so excited, she could hardly wait. She said to get back to the field. And it's not gonna be like home, but to her, that's like home now. And so I love that when the Lord places a call in people's, on people's life, that's where their heart is and they're not happy. And until they go there, what are they doing? They're reaching out to be like Jesus and spread the gospel. And for others, it's just as great a mission field here. America is a mission field, wherever we live. Whatever country it's in, that's our mission field. So these uh, 12 for their immediate mission to us, uh, said, in addition to preparing the 12 for their immediate mission to a limited audience, Jesus gave clear instructions for the ongoing evangelistic, ongoing evangelistic task assigned to his followers through history until he returns. So that's us. We're still here. We don't know when he's going to return, but until he does, all of us that are here, we need to be reading his word and ministering to others in our life should be a testimony of truth and the righteousness and goodness of God, and we should care. So we are to announce, he said, the disciples, Jesus, send them out to announce the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And like the disciples, we will encounter persecution and hardship if, as we obediently take up our crosses and follow Jesus. Now, I like what he said here, but if we give up our lives for him, going wherever he sends us, we are promised eternal life. The Christ sent life. And it brings out in our lesson how, how careful Jesus was to make it clear that it wasn't a matter of if you would face opposition, but that you will face opposition. And so does that mean, well, I just count me out? No, no. I'll tell you what, I, I, it's going to be worth it to see Jesus and live with him forever and ever, to uh, love him and adore him. And I appreciate what he did. And I don't, I want to hear him say, well done, now good and faithful servant. I don't want to hear him say, depart from me. I don't want that. Anyway, we, we are, part one is called Sent by Christ. We are Christ ambassadors. And uh, it, sought, it told us, I wasn't aware of this, but it said one of the most sought after positions in any government is the role of international ambassador. I would have thought that would have been such a, a difficult role to, to, that uh, I wondered how many would want to, but it says that it is a sought after position. And you carry, you carry the authority of your home government. Ambassadors speak, advocate, and even negotiate on their nation's behalf. As Christians, we are the kingdom, our kingdom ambassadors, and represent Jesus to the world. I mean, that is a high calling and very careful we want to be, that we're good representatives 
of Jesus Christ. Jesus sent out the 12 disciples to take his message to the towns of Israel, and he commissioned them and sent out to serve as his representatives carrying this gospel. And that's what they did. He gave them some instructions. This was a wonderful thing. He didn't say, get out there and figure it out, you know, just whatever you want to do, whatever people like, you just say what they like. No, that's not what he said. He gave them specific instructions. They, he said, he told them to focus on the Jewish population. Why? Because that was God's chosen people. And he first wanted to give them the opportunity to hear the gospel. But if they didn't receive it, he said, then you could go on to the other people, to the Gentiles. I'm thankful it was that way. But first, he should want to reach his own. And he did. Get the message to them. And tell them the kingdom of heaven is near. And throughout the book of Acts, when the apostles visited a city, they went first to the Jews and said it was usually in the synagogues and to give them the opportunity to turn to Jesus. And then if they accepted, that was wonderful. If they didn't, they went straight to the Gentiles and began to minister to them. And you would have thought the Jews, they should have been elated to hear that the, about the Messiah because the, it was said in the Old Testament. That was all that they had then. And it was said in the law how that he was coming. They should have been so excited. But they weren't there to hear that the kingdom was near. They ought to have been excited. But no, no, they weren't. They expected him to establish, establish an earthly kingdom because all they could think about was they wanted to get away from this Roman rule. That They were just thinking the earthly things. And, you know, it's hard for us sometimes. We might want to look down on them because, well, they had the... They had it right there talking about the Messiah was coming and here he had come, born in Bethlehem, just like the prophets had said. We can say all of those things, but, you know, we're thinking with the with the, the modern mind, and it's like my world history teacher, Mr. Bazaar, always told us, you can't think with the modern mind when you're studying history. You have to think like they did, things they didn't know. But I'm thinking, but they did know from what, and they knew he was coming, but it didn't happen in their way, and wrong expectations can become a stumbling block. And he didn't come the way they had expected. And this, if they could just get out from under the Roman rule, but that wasn't what the Lord had. So what did they do? They rejected. They didn't want to hear. And only by dying could uh, he break. He said, Jesus' kingdom could not be established through rebellion or combat, but through sacrifice. Only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Hebrews 2 and 14. And so he began to tell them, Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to give you power. And he said, and, and, the, and he gave him a command to perform miracles, heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, leprosy, cast out demons, give as freely as you have received. But he warned them, he said, just be cautious, don't be involved, don't get so taken up with like money and things like that. And yes, it is, uh, the workman is worthy of, of their hire. And so, and another thing you don't want to do though is to say, and they, they'll, if I if I won't say some of this stuff, they'll pay me more. Not that we speak truth. We never want to compromise. And this is the one thing that is some people may do. Sometimes uh, they don't because people might get angry with them or something, or think, well, you know, uh, and I've got to feed my family, and so I'll just say what they want me to say. No, we don't. We don't want to be like that. But speak the truth. It's the thing the Lord will hold us accountable. So we want to speak the truth. He taught them that a worker is worthy of being compensated for his or her work. And there would be, uh, I'm sure there would have been like food and things like that that would be given to them to assist them in, in their travels as, as they ministered. And Jesus sent, they talked about offer of redemption. Jesus sent the apostles to the Jews first, even though he knew some Jews would be resistant. And it would be, a, a, our writer brings out that we may have a tough audience too. Uh, they had, uh, when they went out, their, their very own, their own very own people, they were Jews and the Jews, would not receive them. In fact, it, could, it was very difficult at times. But, and he wanted us to be prepared, and that's something we have to realize, is that we may have a tough audience. You know who the tough audience, sometimes the, one of the toughest audience you'll have sometimes is family. That if, they're, if they don't accept Jesus as their Savior, and there are people that may, they just may want a little bit of, of salvation. Really, you, you just, it's just take it all. It's all or none, really. But there are people, they, they just want a little bit. They don't want to really, as we say, plunge in. I had a friend that, that said, when, I get, when, I, when I'm going to do something, she said, I just want to jump in with all fours. And she said, that's what, the way I do things. And that's the way it should be that we want to just jump in with all fours, to just totally commit our lives to the Lord. And, you know, all of your family members will not always like that. And they will, uh, they may say all manner of things about you, and they do, and I've experienced it, and many, many people have, but, and it's in those times and that it is, that, that we actually grow. 
but we uh, we have to be cautious that we don't get beat down. We can't accept it that way. But Jesus made it clear that you are going to suffer things. You will suffer. Well, not maybe, but he said if. It was not if, but when. And when it does happen, this is how you handle it. That's what he helps us to know. And he was our example because he knew what it was. So his own family didn't accept. He knew what that was like. And then many others, you know, even the church world as a whole did not. But he kept right on. He didn't back down and say, Father, I've changed my mind. No, he's, he was going to carry through. Jesus told his, uh, his disciples when they went out to minister, select a worthy person to stay with in each town they visited. That was Matthew 10 and 11. Someone with a good, uh, good reputation. They were receptive to, this, to their message. They would listen. They would be a true, like we could say, a true believer. And they would stay there while they were in that location. They would stay there with that person. They didn't just go from house to house to house all the time. They didn't do that. They found a place. They just got established there. And then they, they would move, move on. To the to the next next town, but it mentioned here that in their in this day and age and, and their, in their in their culture back then it was considered a high honor uh, that if a, for you to take in strangers, and now we would think we would be hesitant to do that, but in their culture at that time it was an honor, and so if they would. When they left a certain house, they were to leave the town as well. And to salute a family, it says to salute a family, which it means instructs the disciples to do the same in verse 12, was to show kindness and customary signs of respect. The usual sal salutation of the day was the blessing, peace be with you. And it brought out that what this said was, peace be with you was more than just a casual blessing because it would have been made in the name of Jesus. Peace be with you in the name of Jesus. And so what a wonderful, wonderful salute it was. To salute a family was to say that. And uh, so it had the power to bring genuine peace to their home and their lives. And, but there would, might be places, might be times that they would not be accepted. Uh, they, they, it's, it's going to happen. There's some people that do not want to receive. And they may not be receptive then. It could be that they are later. And so you can't just keep on, keep on at the same person came, trying, trying to get them ex to accept. Yes, we present the message, and we may again and again, but if they are totally resistant, I think we can pray and move on to, uh, to another person. His priority was to give the Jews the first chance to respond to good news. If they refused, it said they were no longer to be treated as the chosen people of God. I thought, well, that's strong. <laughs> but uh, you still prayed for them. But he mentioned here, that when they were, went to a, a, if a household or a town refused to show hospitality to the disciples or to receive their message, they were to shake off the dust from their from your feet as you leave. It said, and you know we've read that scripture, and I have heard of there's a particular group of people they that they go door to door, and I've been told some people have said they've actually seen them when they left because they didn't receive them, and they told them I'm a child of God, and I I don't adhere to your message that you're wanting to bring. I don't believe it's in agreement with God's word. And they treat him with respect, but they would say, I don't, I don't accept. I'm a child of God already. And said they watched as those people left and they literally did uh, shake the dust off of their feet as they left. And so, but said that the disciples were to shake its dust from your feet as you leave. And this it said, after, this reflected a common practice of the Jews at that time after traveling, even in a Gentile town. Think of this. The Jews, when they traveled in or through a Gentile town or region, they would stop and shake off the dust from their sandals before re-entering the promised land. I did not know that. I thought, my, you know, we learned so much in, in our Sunday school lessons. I'm so thankful that we still have Sunday school at our church. And I appreciate the things we learn. And so the disciples were to treat those who rejected their message as unbelieving Gentiles. So Jesus said a town that rejected the good news would, would be worse off than Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment. That is a frightening thing. I'm telling you, we're going to stand, stand before God. When you go into uh, the scriptures and you read sometime, it will describe Jesus like you go in, into the book of Revelation. And there's another place over in the Old Testament. I cannot recall where it is right now, but it talks about uh, what he looked like. Talked about, especially let's go to Revelation. I believe it's chapter 1. talks about the eyes of fire we begin to describe Jesus what he was like and I thought my uh, I don't want to I don't want to see that when, but being if I've rejected the Lord and to see that those eyes and how it would look to have him reject and tell you you didn't accept me and now I won't stand for you 
He wants us to stand for Him as children. If we're going to be children of God, He wants us to stand for Him. He stood for us. He went through so much for us. The least we can do is stand for Him. This is digressing a bit, but I, I just feel like it's the, a good thing to mention it. I attended a funeral, uh, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago, for a lady who had lived for the Lord, and she had uh, contracted a, a dementia, Alzheimer's, and when uh, I attended her funeral service, that was one of the things that, that one of the ministers said, was that, and he was the pastor of the church, and though she was so bad, she hardly knew even where she was or what was going on. When they would say, let's have a testimony, have testimony service, and many churches I know don't have that anymore, but he said she would be the first one on her feet, and off, oftentimes she would say, Jesus stood for me, I want to stand for him. And you know that has stayed with me ever since I heard Brother Scott Harper, the pastor there, say that. And, and he has mentioned some other things I wish I could remember that occasionally she would say, but she would get a certain phrase she would say from time to time. It would be maybe the same thing again and again. That was one I remember said, he stood for me, I'm going to stand for him. And then she would be seated. But that's what, all that she knew to do was capable of saying at that time. But you know, that's a great statement. And even in her limited uh, uh, capacity that she had, she served the Lord with actually with joy and gladness. So what a wonderful thing that we can do. He knows, uh, it says, Jesus shifts his focus from sending the disciples on a specific mission to prophesying concerning the Great Commission. And he had told them, and you know, they were supposed to, they were to heal the sick, they could uh, they raise the dead, and all of these things. He talked about ministering, leading them to Christ. He, he sent them out to to do the work. But he said to them that the thing in the, in the scriptures that talks about how that they were to be harmless as doves, they were to be shrewd. Uh, and then when they went out, he, he was sending them into a perilous situation, sheep among wolves. It was not a question of if they would be persecuted for his sake, but rather when it was going to happen. It just was. And much of the world mentions here that it's growing increasingly intolerant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know that. Uh, that you hear this many times and we're beginning to see it and many times there would be people that would violently and vocally oppose God he knew that they were going to face this and, and that they did in his day and it possibly can happen here he said they should approach these dangers this is how you should approach this they were to be as wise or as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves he said the Greek word for a wise or shrewd means prudent and I, I like that word of being prudent there's just something about that word that says, speaks. You know, the, the word, that they can mean the same things, but they say something different to each person. So whether you like wise, shrewd, or prudent, uh, that rather than being conniving or underhanded, they were to be straightforward and sincere. And definitely they should be living the life. And just uh, when they face danger, it should be, be very prudent and still show the love of the Lord. And Jesus would give these warnings to them. And, you know, was he trying to frighten them? No, he was trying to prepare them for what was going to happen. Uh, he wanted them, he knew that there were going to be times that opportunities for persecution that would bring uh, advance to the kingdom. And this is what we see that happened in later on in our lesson. It brings it, I'll just bring it out now, that in the book of Acts, you know, they, you know, they'd been filled with the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and the Lord had been moving, miracles was going on. It was a wonderful thing. And how they just enjoyed it. They was having church just like every day. And they just stayed right there. And they were supposed to go out. That was the Lord's message for them was to go out and to preach the gospel, spread the good news. But they were right there. I mean, it was wonderful just having revival all the time. And what moved them to action was persecution. And they began to leave. And that, that most all of them left except for those disciples there. That was those core believers that he had taught, those apostles, the 12. Except, you know, we know that Judas... Uh, disobeyed him and but how these others then the rest of these people many of them departed they left what they do they spread the gospel wherever they went and that's what the disciples and we're you know we're disciples of the Lord there was the 12 that core we know that but the rest of us are disciples of Christ and have we spread out and everywhere we go and that's what he wanted them to spread and that's what they did everywhere they went they spread the good news and so when this uh, all of this they begin to bring persecution to the people they thought they were going to stamp it out it was like a fire that every time they'd stamp it it would just it would just spread somewhere else and so everywhere they went how the lord blessed them and helped them 
and the Holy Spirit would give them the correct words to speak at the time that was needed. That's what he brought out. He didn't, I don't, he didn't want to frighten them. He wanted to prepare them when they faced persecution. So the Holy Spirit would give them the correct words to speak so the effectiveness of their witness would be maximized. That was in the scriptures there was verses 19 and 20. That was in Matthew chapter 10. So the Lord, was he was preparing them. He didn't just say, go figure it out. He didn't do that. The kingdom expands through persecution. And, and it's true, it does. A, a great wave of persecution, as I mentioned, had come. And the people were scattered uh, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, and they preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. And so uh, the source of this hatred, where did, was it those people that were just being hateful? No, it was Satan that was working it in them. It was Satan that he, hey, he doesn't want truth. And, and I will say this for sure, it is, it is a certain thing, is that especially if, if you are a if you're a leader of any kind, if you're a church leader, or if uh, I, I, that's who the devil is, especially going after a minister, he'd go after any, if you're a teacher, or if you're a child of God, I don't care where you are, if you're being effective, if your life is effective and people are being touched, I guarantee you Satan's going to try to take you down. He'll try to, he'll, they may somebody tell lies on you. They, we've, I've all, you've all had it happen to us, but Jesus did. They said all kinds. They accused him of being a devil and all kinds of things. What did he do? Did he go call to come to the go to the father and say, "I can't do it. They're they're being mean to me." He knew it was going to happen, and what he did was remain true. I'm so glad he did. I'm so glad he did because he did. I have the plan of salvation for me that I could be saved, be with the Holy Spirit, love the Lord, and serve Him and honor Him. Thank the Lord. Move and spread the gospel. Where some of these disciples or these Christians, when they went out, they weren't required to just keep on staying right there in that town. If that was the Lord's plan for them to be there, but if they were going to continue to be persecuted and wouldn't be able to actually minister what they did, they went to the next place. As I've already said, it was just like spreading uh, the fire of Pentecost, is what it did. As they began to spread the gospel, as everywhere they went. But they just began talking about the Lord and others were saved. It did accept. There was, there's always somebody that's ready to receive the Lord. But spread the word wherever we go. And the task of reaching the lost people is still before us. We, that is the thing for us to do until Jesus returns or until, we're, until our life is gone. And, you know, I thought of the recent death of uh, Peg, uh, Peg McCamey Bean of the, the McCameys and such a wonderful testimony, a Christian woman. And, suffered a stroke on December the 11th, I believe, and went to be with the Lord early, I believe the 26th of December. And I thought a life that was lived for Jesus and such a joyful Christian, and that was her testimony from so many people that knew her uh, there, not just knew her out, what she was in the public, but she said she was the same, so totally devoted, and no telling how many people she touched. That people today are saving, are saved and serving the Lord because of her testimony and seeing her joy in times of uh, maybe deep distress or whatever. That's the thing. If people watch us, and how do we respond in times of difficulty? You know, anybody can be faithful when everything is going well, but if things aren't, that you can still hold your head up. I think of how Jesus, when he was being maligned by the leaders in the church, I mean, to think how they criticized him, condemned him, accused him of being a devil, all kinds, and here he was, uh, these marvelous miracles and the blessing he was being to the people, and they was accusing him, but he does it because through the devil, think awful things, he didn't run and hide, and but it had hurt, you know, he was here walking on the earth as a man, it hurt, you better believe it hurt, it hurt him, but he was there to do the will of his heavenly father, may that be us that we will still do the will of our Heavenly Father. And when people look at us because they've heard some lie about and they look at you, you know, with a glance, you know that something's not right. That's when, he, but Jesus just kept being who he was. He was a child, he was his, he was the son of the, of the Heavenly Father. He knew that and he knew who he was and he just kept right on speaking truth. You know why? Because he wanted us, he was here for us to set that he could, that while our sins could be forgiven, he did go ahead and suffer the cross, the horrible, one of the most agonizing deaths you could suffer. But he did it for us. And when he died, you know, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And you know what? He rested. Uh, he didn't just die. He rested because he had done. He had done the will of the Father. And then what happened? Three days up from the grave, he arose. Thank the Lord. He is alive today. 
So during persecution, I have written a note here, keep your eyes on Jesus. That's what we must do. Keep our eyes on Jesus. What did Jesus do? He remained faithful. Help us to be that way. Part three, do not be afraid. Boldly acknowledge Jesus. Now, when we hear that, it said don't be afraid. Uh, there's going to be... I think what this is saying truly is don't be afraid that you won't make it or that but it's, there is a natural fear of something that's going to, you know, pain or suffering that you would have, but that we can trust the Lord, that we're faithful to Him, and that our salvation is secure in Him if we're true to Him, if we remain true. Lord, help us to be true and faithful. One day, on the day of judgment, those who have been faithful to God will be rewarded. No one on earth can take this reward away. Human beings may be able to destroy our bodies, but they cannot touch our eternal souls. How many people, they've lost their lives for Jesus. Many, and you hear of some that I, I've mentioned before, it just touches me that when they are not martyred and others are martyred, they feel like they have failed the Lord and they weren't faithful enough to Him to be a martyr. You know, we don't think like that. But I tell you, in other lands around this world, there are people that are so devoted to the Lord and they're under, they're, they're under severe persecution but they are so faithful to the Lord. And they're, they have, they're anchored in the Lord with all of their heart. And yes, there is maybe fear of, you know, especially like if, if they are killed and their family is left, but they have such faith, trust, and confidence in God to take care of things. And, the, and they know that their life, in a sense, is not precious in that it's just, it belongs to the Lord. And that whatever, live or die, they're going to be faithful to the Lord because even if they die, they know they're going straight to live with the Lord forever and ever, to, uh, to live as Christ, to die as gain. And let us never be ashamed to be accounted as a follower. And I think I've already mentioned it, but he talked about being very cautious that you didn't start uh, watering down the word well, uh, rather than just speaking truth the way it was, that you begin to compromise that and say what they wanted you to say. No, we've got to say what Jesus said. We've got to say what the word says. Let us never be afraid or ashamed to be counted as a follower of Christ. During persecution, the key thing is to keep our eyes on Jesus. You think about Peter. He was the first martyr that we know of. And what is they were stoning him. And that was a, those were not just little tiny things, stones, uh, little rocks that stoned him. It was huge stones. And in that ag But you know what he did? He kept, he, he kept his eyes on Jesus. And he said, I see Jesus as he was dying. He said, you know what? Jesus actually let him see, just like part of the heavens, I guess, for him to see. And he said, I see, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. And others said there he was welcomed, there to welcome Stephen. And you know, just to have that uh, in picture in our mind when we'd be going through something, maybe we, at the moment we're thinking of what we're going through. But if we could remember that Jesus is seeing us, we may not see the heavens open, but he is watching and he is pleased when we honor him and obey him. Let us never be ashamed or afraid to be counted as a follower of Christ. Some people want to be secret Christians. And you hear of those in other land, maybe they're not allowed to say anything about the Lord, and but yet their life speaks. And the people they work with or around want to know. I notice that you have such a joy and a peace and a quietness. What is it? They notice that. They see and what is it's Jesus in their lives. So it's a... Uh, it's wonderful that we can do that. That, and I will tell you this: that, I, that the, you know, when when Satan fell, it was a third of the angels fell with him. Two thirds did not. And so I, I heard it said one time. A, a lady said she was praying about this, and there had been some well-known ministers that had had fallen in disgrace. And of course, it was made public. And you know, many times they, uh, the world likes to brag about those things. But she was taught praying about it, and there had been people that were really, they thought, dedicated to the Lord. And she said that the Lord impressed on her heart that what happens, said the devil only has, said he has a third of the angels. Two-thirds did not. And so what he does, he goes to be to be the most effective. He doesn't have as many angels as, as you know, Jesus does, of having all those many, many, no telling how many millions of angels. angels. And she said, so what he does, he goes for leaders. He goes for the leaders in an organization. He goes to take them down, just get, tempt them and tempt them. 
they will fall into sin. And what happens, there are many of the people that have loved them and appreciated them. They will really become discouraged and say, well, if this leader couldn't live for God, then I can't. That's wrong. And I know of, of this happened, a, a, gentleman, a person called the pastor, called their pastor when one of these men, well-known people had, had failed. And I will say this came back to the Lord, totally surrendered and continues to work for the Lord. But this person said, how can I expect to live for God if he couldn't? Then how can I, how can I live for God? And that pastor stopped him right then and you stopped right there. He said, who saved you? Did that preacher save you or did Jesus Christ save you? He said, Jesus Christ is who saved you. That's who our eyes are upon. We're going to pray for this person that fell. We're going to pray for them. Satan is out to take everybody down. If he can take a leader down, he can take more people down with him. That's sad, but it, does, it has happened. And so that's another reason for us to be faithful. That because in the eyes of some, you may be the only person. Maybe you have an influence on me. You may not realize the influence that you have. We may not. May we continue to be faithful to the Lord. Have a sweet spirit. And no matter what we go through, Lord, help us to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. The song says, all I ask is to be like you. Yes, Lord. Jesus promises, I love this. Jesus promises this. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. That is from Matthew 10 and verse 32 in the New Living Translation. So, the, and he, then he says, on the other hand, anyone who denies Jesus on earth will be denied by Jesus in heaven. And he would tell his disciples near the end of his ministry, I am the way, the truth, and and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Let's be faithful to him. That I just think he stood for us. Let's stand for him. Be true because as horrible as I think of the people that are, uh, suffer in prisons and suffer in so many unbearable situations but they love the Lord and they know that to live is Christ to die is gain. They know this. So either way they're a child of God. They feel, they believe this and understand I'm a, I'm a, I'm a winner either way. If I'm suffering here or if I go on to be, if I go on to be with the Lord, I have the Lord. I have the Lord here and I'll live with him forever there. Fully committed. It's a full, a full commitment to make it. That's the people that will make it through, people who make a total full commitment. This is from Matthew chapter 10. We'll be studying Matthew 10, 34 through 42. Jesus was fully aware that people who were committed to his kingdom would experience conflict with friends and even family members. And I've already alluded to this, but that is very difficult when it is family. But Jesus himself even experienced that. All of his family didn't accept him, especially not at the beginning. Some later did. Following Jesus requires complete allegiance. Complete allegiance. But the world stands in opposition to the kingdom and we see that that it seems to be worsening but quoting uh, from in the prophet in Micah 7 and 6 Jesus declared that he as the Messiah had come to set those who followed him against those who did not regardless of their relationship Matthew 10 35 and 36 and he confronted his followers concerns about the cost of being his disciples he said yes you may lose family relationships some of you will and even your lives because of, of your shift in old in allegiance from family tradition to serving the Lord. Well, we've always done it this way. You may have, but you didn't serve Jesus. Jesus is the way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. We studied last week that he is that narrow door. I believe it was last week's lesson. He is that narrow door. It's not always easy, but he wanted his people is to weigh the cost. Before you make this choice to live for me, you need to weigh the cost. I tell you what, let's count the cost and know that to live eternally with him. I cannot imagine, I thought of the horror today of missing of missing him. I talked to my husband today. We, uh, my sister had uh, her, her Christmas today, Christmas meal, and we'd been there, and I, I was just thinking about the, the privilege and honor of knowing the Lord. I thought about, I, I've talked about the people that we know that have lived for God, and then they have turned away from the Lord. The people that have grown up in church, have been around it, and never accepted the Lord. I said, what will that be like? to go to a devil's hell no, and you had the privilege that you could have lived for the Lord and the lives you could have influenced that you could have touched for the Lord I said I cannot imagine an eternity eternity that's unending to live with that when we have the privilege the opportunity to accept the Lord it will be worth it all 
Heaven will be cheap at any cost. It's often said, you know, that's a true statement. Heaven will be cheap at any cost. It may just seem unbearable what we're experiencing. But in, co in comparison, I tell you what, you know, it's going to be forever with heaven or for heaven in the burning hell with and cast to, cast to the lake of fire with the devil. Forever and ever and ever, no ending. No, it's worth it. Opposition is often the cross. Believers must bear to obediently follow Christ. It means death to self. All right, here we go. Death to self, family relationships, and a familiar lifestyle. Yet whatever a person sacrifices to follow Christ is worth it, even their own life. I love this. So I appreciate these things our writer has said. All right. And there's a, he gave them a lot of practical travel instructions. Uh, the father cares about their physical welfare as they do the work of spreading the gospel. And they were to uh, people were to receive them with with hospital. Uh, they should be hospitable. Some would not be. But here's what he said. Now listen to this: those who receive them with hospitality and generosity, accepting their message and acknowledging the one who sent them, will take part in their reward. You think about that. You think sometimes, well, what am I doing? Well, what about that times that we we give offerings? You know, the Lord hasn't called me to go overseas, and but and but we I give to missions to people that are overseas. You know, when we when we do that, I'm not the only many people do that. And when we pray for those people, we pray for them. You know what? When we when we get to heaven, if we're faithful and we're in heaven, we're going to be rewarded for that too. It's it's the people that went, yes, but those of us who prayed for them and helped them, maybe uh, financially, we can't help them all. You know, but but we we can't help them all as far as with uh, uh, monetarily. But our prayers, every time they cross our mind, let's pray for them, right? Then I just say, I wonder what they're doing. We may wonder, but let's just pray right then. Lord, whatever they're doing, whatever ministry you have them in, you know, uh, just pray. Maybe it's not the Lord will quicken you to pray for them. Maybe you'll find out later they were in a dire situation. But you were faithful to pray. I tell you, God is watching. He sees what's happening. We will take part in their reward. All right, so we go now to one of the final parts of our lesson. What is God saying to us? As followers of Christ, our primary purpose is to accurately represent Him to the world. And so we just, that's what we want to be accurate. It just, and we want to be loving, full of the Lord, the grace and kindness of God. And it doesn't mean, like I said, we have to be floor mats to people, but Satan uses the world system to trap people in all kinds of sin. But then, like our writer said, Jesus offers the only way out the gospel of Jesus Christ, his gospel. Come to him, he cleanses from sin. Jesus sends us out as sheep among wolves, and when we obey, going wherever he sends us, what does he do? He promises us his strength, his presence and and presence in this life and eternal rewards in the next. It will be worth it all. So we live a hundred years here. That's a long time. But I think we can honestly say, like I can now, is that I, I'm 25 years away from 100, but I think, where did 75 years go? It just seems impossible. But here I am at that at that stage. And, you know, it's going to be worth it all to see Jesus, to love him, to be able to. I just want to hug him and thank him for dying on the cross, for calling me to preach his glorious gospel. Just thank him for it. Ministry in action. Three things our writer has brought out. Spend additional time in prayer asking Jesus to help us to know him better so we can accurately represent him with our words and our actions. And I'll just add this, and I've mentioned it a lot, but people say sometimes, well, I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. And I tell people, then probably you won't. If you're aware of that, you're going to be kind, you're going to be polite, and you, you very likely won't say the wrong thing. If you just express love to people, that you're there to help them, that you love, you're praying for them, you know, Many people will respond to that. Some, if they don't, we can still pray for them too. I'm sorry I offended you, but I, I will keep praying for you. Assess your willingness to stand firm when facing persecution. Determine to proclaim the gospel no matter the cost. It's a determination we have to make. It's up to us. And lastly, accept the responsibility of being a sent one or that, that ambassador and share the gospel with at least one person this week. Let's do our very best for Jesus. He gave his all for us. Let's just dedicate our lives completely to him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and honor to have taught your word tonight. Just thank you we can be faithful to you. Lord, I honor you. I revere you. You're the great I am. Lord, we give ourselves to you to be used of you all day, every day, in every way. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 
We look forward to seeing you next Saturday night late. You be blessed. See you, Kelly. You have a good evening. Bye-bye.